Now you have observed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions, my sufferings, and what befell me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. Yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, of all who desire to live a godly life in Jesus Christ will be persecuted, while evil men and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceivers and deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The word of God and the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Dawson.
more people started having staycations because of the high gas prices. So in 2009, it was added to the Webster's Dictionary. Upcycle. This is the last one. Upcycle. The combination of up and recycle means using discarded objects to create a product that is actually of higher value. It first appeared in 1994, and since then it's become a part of a movement uh, for us to change the way that we focus on reusing things that otherwise would have been thrown out. Now, I'm pretty sure you all are at that point of asking the first question that you should ask of every sermon, what's the point? What's the point? So, as we continue with our sermon series based on Adam Hamilton's book, Making Sense of the Bible, the fact that new words are created, and, and, and all the time, this happens all the time, it is significant. Because Paul used a word that has tripped up some folks as to how to interpret scripture. The word he uses is theonustros, theonustros, which is generally interpreted to mean God-inspired, God-inspired. But what is interesting is it did not appear in scripture or in the Greek language before Paul used it in this scripture rest reference that was read for us from 2 Timothy. And because of this, we have no reference as to what Paul was talking about. We have no clue. So what does theonustros mean? For some, it means that the Bible is literally God breathed. In reading uh, my translation of the Bible, going along with the scripture, which translation is this? It says, new, the New International Version uses that God breathed uh, wording. And it, for it to be considered God breathed, that means that God dictated every word, and the authors were simply just acting as scribes. But if, um, if that were the case, and there is another story in the Bible where God literally breathed life into Adam, a different term was used in Scripture and interpret it into the Greek. So if we follow this whole understanding of God, the scripture being God-breathed, then the Bible has to be infallible and inerrant. However, the idea of scripture being God-dictated did not exist until the 19th century, when many were questioning the authority of the Bible. None of the historical creeds, those from the first 500 years of the Christian faith, None of them mention an infallible or inerrant Bible, and none begin with an affirmation of faith in the scriptures. We say our affirmation of faith pretty much every Sunday, the Apostles' Creed. <coughs> Consider that. We say that we, we're talking about the pillars of faith being Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We don't mention scripture. So instead, it is possible that Paul was using this theonustros word to refer to scripture that inspires us each time we read. Perhaps you've had the experience. Maybe you've read a fairly familiar scripture or story only to hear a brand new meaning into that. God inspired maybe how we are inspired uh, as we read these scriptures. I remember preaching a story uh, on the story of the feeding of the 5,000. If you're not familiar with that story, um, it's a time where Jesus was preaching. There's a big, large crowd and they, there was no food, and it was late in the day. And so Jesus took two fish and five loaves of bread and fed everyone with that. But one of the congregants came up to me afterwards and thanked me because she had heard a, a piece of this story that she had never heard before concerning the leftovers, the leftover pieces of bread and fish. The point I made is that uh, Jesus does not leave anyone or anything behind. In this story, the disciples went around picking up all the leftover pieces, and they had 12 baskets full of leftovers. And so that was the piece that, I, that uh, seemed to inspire her at that point. She never heard that detail of that particular story. What we read as God-inspired, Theonustros, can be uh, seen as divine influence, both on the scripture writers, but also on us as the readers. So I wanted you to hear this quote from the book. Where did I put it? Here it is. <coughs> Um, from the author here. This is Adam Hamilton speaking. Through the words of the Bible, the Holy Spirit has spoken and continues to speak. It is inspired and it inspires. 
Its words, coupled with the Spirit's power, are useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may pr be proficient, equipped for every good work. And it also reflects, at times, the limitations, the biases, and the assumptions of its human authors. The scripture that was read for us, I keep pointing to Dawson as if he's still there. He's not. Um, the scripture that was read for us from 2 Timothy speaks about scripture being truly God-inspired for its authors and for us as its readers. So here's another question to consider when you're looking at the Bible. Is the Bible the Word of God? Is the Bible the Word of God? There's one particular place where the Word of God is quite literally dictated and inscribed in stone, and that is the presentation of the Ten Commandments. We see the Bible as a compilation of many authors with different styles and focal points, but all inspired by God. I truly believe that. And yet, similar to, let's say, a biography uh, of a famous person. you got that in your head. Just think of a famous person and someone writing that biography. Perhaps we might be able to see uh, a little bit as an analogy of the Bible as a biography of God and the story of God's interaction with God's people. So consider an authorized biography. Pick anybody, Steve Jobs, you know, J.K. Rowling, anybody. I'm sure that the subject, the person of this biography, had direct input, and they're probably often quoted directly. But the tone and the viewpoint of the person would come from its authors. So in theological, techy, churchy terms, we call that hermeneutics. There's a, there's a red letter word for you. Just throw that around your next uh, party there. It's this lens with which the author views the world and the subject in order to present a written document. So it's how they view the world and how they view the one that they're evaluating. That's where this hermeneutic comes through. And we, too, hold to a hermeneutic. We have our own lens. We have a 21st century lens of experiences with which to read and to wrestle with Scripture. We are going to be doing some serious wrestling with Scriptures, um, particularly in the next couple of weeks. We have a long tradition within the Christian church to, to draw from, from it wisdom and some knowledge as we seek to better understand, and also, more importantly, I think, to understand, yes, but to apply it. How do we apply Scripture to today? We have the gift of reason. God gave us each a brain, amen? amen. All with it. Um, add more of those magic beans, the, the, it'll trigger. <coughs> and we have this gift of reason, which allows us to gather meaning and purpose as we seek to live lives like Jesus would have us live, amen? amen. So we also have the greatest lens with which to view Scripture. So I'd like you all, if, uh, either on your tablets or your smartphones or pew Bibles, to turn to the Gospel of John. It's, uh, if you uh, get to the New Testament, it's about three quarters of the way back, fourth Gospel in, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. First chapter, first verse. First chapter, first verse. Gospel of John. There are four books in Bible John. We're looking at the Gospel. All right? Everybody there? Let's read this together. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made, and without Him nothing was made that has been made. Skip down to verse 14. Skip down to verse 14. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The true word of God is Jesus Christ. Jesus became flesh and gives us a specific hermeneutic with which to view Scripture. When you spend some time in Scripture, you're going to read about um, how the law says that you, if someone is committing adultery, you're supposed to stone them. And yet we can turn to Jesus who, when he was faced with an adulterous woman said to her, go and sin no more. 
When faced with this multi-tiered system, status system of those who were in and those who were shunned, <coughs> Jesus shares a drink from a well with a supposed outcast, a woman, a Samaritan woman, an enemy. At a time when tax collectors were seen as the lowest of the lowest scum uh, on the earth, Jesus calls Matthew to follow me. Follow me. When hanging unjustly on a cross to face a criminal's death, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. So when we consider uh, if Scripture is the Word of God, Theologian Karl Barth put it this way. The Bible contains the word of God found within its human authors. We've reached another question for us to consider. And I think we've touched on this just a little bit. Is the Bible ever wrong? Is the Bible ever wrong? Now some will claim the Bible cannot be an error because it's the word of God. And yet there are passages that do definitely contradict one another. We talked about one when we looked at Proverbs 26, verse 4, verse, and, and then compared that to verse 5. They pretty much directly contradict one another. Now, we've addressed some others in past sermons, and this one I'm going to have you take a look at also. You flip to 1 Samuel, so I'm going to have you move to the front of the Bible. So it's uh, the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Um, and then you keep flipping back, and you get Samuel King's Chronicles. Look at 1 Samuel, chapter uh, 17. I'm not going to read this. I'm just pointing it out. It's the whole story of David and Goliath. The whole story is in that chapter. Okay? So I'm going to have you keep flipping, or keep scrolling on your tablet, if that's what you use on your phone. Now go over to 2 Samuel 21, 19. 2 Samuel 21, verse 19. Twenty-one, nineteen. Fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. In another battle with the Philistines, at Gob, Elhanan, son of Jair, the Bethlehemite, killed Goliath, the Gittite. Who killed Goliath? Was it David or was it Elhanan? So, uh, for those who believe that the Bible can't be wrong, that it's inerrant, these pages present a problem. Now, perhaps... Something was lost in the numerous translations. We know that the Bible was not written in, in English, not even Old English. Um, and so there may have been something that was lost in the translation. It's also likely that the authors of Scripture placed their own slant on the telling of the stories, reflecting their environment and the status quo of the day. So considering the fact that the Bible was constructed with human authors, inspired by God, it is likely there are times when scripture needs to be carefully evaluated. Various authors with differing views may present some challenges as we seek to hear and uh, hear God speaking to us through scripture. So I have to ask you all a question. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever been reading a passage and for some reason the words just feel like they're jumping right off the page and speaking directly to you? I have. I've had that happen. Not too long ago, we did the uh, sermon series on music and the psalms, where we compared different genres of music to different styles of, or different types of songs. And I have to tell you, before we did that sermon series, I hadn't spent a whole lot of time in the psalms. I hadn't spent a lot of time studying them. But I found a deeper meaning and a different focus as we were going through those scriptures together. And so I trust that this is your experience as well. And if you have never read the Bible, if you have never read Scripture, you've never taken any time to do this, I suggest you start. And you can start anywhere. Just pick a place to start. I do always recommend the book of Mark to start with. It's not because that's my husband's name. <laughs> he will swear it does. Um, but that is the shortest gospel, probably uh, most likely the first gospel that was written. It reads, and I'll say this for the over 40 crowd, it reads like an Indiana Jones movie. Okay, It reads like an Indiana Jones movie. It's just fast-paced, one thing after another. And it's a good, it's 16 chapters, it's very easy to read. And so I would encourage you to start there and, and read the story of Jesus and his time. So as you read, 
You have to consider the context of the author. Consider the societal norms. And I could really challenge you and have you look at the history of what was going on at the time. Consider why Jesus would say things like, love your enemies. Consider why the apostles came to the decision that they did in Acts chapter 15. And I'm going to have you turn to that one too. Y'all are being like, oh man, not again. Okay. New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. It's the fifth book in chapter 15. Something significant happens here. What's going on is that um, Jesus first came to the Jews, and uh, suddenly the word was being uh, presented to the Gentiles. I'm pretty sure all of us here are considered Gentiles, okay? So the word went to the Gentiles. They were receiving the Holy Spirit, and this group had couldn't figure out how to handle that. So look at verse 15. The word of the prophet. Oh, okay, wait a minute. That's not right. Sorry. I think it's verse 5. Yeah, verse 5. Sorry. Then some of the believers who belong to the party of the Pharisees, remember the Pharisees are the, you know, ultra, um, those who really held to the law. When they came to Jerusalem, um, I'm sorry. Uh, let me try again. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider this question, and after much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving, giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts with faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we are saved just as they are. What just happened there? What just happened there? The, ap the apostles had this dilemma. They had to interpret scripture in a special way concerning the Gentiles. And so they had to make the decision that we are going to set aside the law of Moses because we are saved uh, through faith by grace in Jesus Christ. And so there were only a couple of parts of the law they felt were important to, to maintain, but the rest of it didn't apply. Wow, that's a major interpretation of scripture to fit the time and the, and the situation that was going on. So I pray for um, God to inspire you and to stir something in your heart that, uh, <laughs> to, be, to be more like the true word of God, to be more like Jesus Christ. For the next couple of weeks, we're going to be addressing the questions that are noted in your bulletin. Um, we're also going to be looking at another common question that I get asked by a lot of young people, particularly young children, all the time. Were there dinosaurs on the ark? Were there dinosaurs on the ark? And so we're going to look at those different questions. Were Adam and Eve real people? Why does God seem so violent in the Old Testament? I don't have my bullet in front of me, but there's a, there's a bunch of other questions that we're going to be addressing. It's going to take us two weeks, and these are hard to get through, so I'm warning you in advance. These are going to be tough, and we're going to be wrestling together. And so I pray that you will um, keep an open mind. And help us to wrestle together. Let's, let's be in a dialogue instead of, you know, just me doing the talking. All right? May God continue to bless and strengthen us as we truly hear and receive the word of God for the people.